Hello everybody, welcome to another edition of This Week in Irish History. I'm Dan Murphy, with me as always our senior editor Lou Samoji. Today's just a busy week in Notre Dame history as we wind down the end of the 2013 season. The, every 5 and 10 years, the 13 and 18s are always pretty big ones for, for yeah. Notre Dame history. And uh, This time we'll start 70 years ago, back in 1943. It was the final game of the year for Notre Dame. They were playing the Great Lakes Academy, which was one of those teams that popped up because of World War II. And it was one of the better Notre Dame teams in, in history, right there. Probably the toughest schedule in college football history, and the reason that game comes to mind, the Great Lakes, is watching the Auburn-Georgia game last week, and you think to yourself, gosh, has Notre Dame ever lost a game like that? And the last school in the world that should ever lose on a Hail Mary pass is Notre Dame, named after Mary and everything. But um, that 43 game, Notre Dame's 9 0, ranked number one. And back then there were only 76 college teams playing. Uh, most of the SEC didn't have teams, others uh, didn't either because of the World War II rush. And so they created these semi pro Iowa pre flight and Great Lakes Naval with a lot of former college players, plus also future college players, like one of them was Emil Sitko, who was a four year leading rusher at Notre Dame from 46 through 49. He played for Great Lakes. But anyway, Notre Dame goes ahead late in the final minute, and then uh, Great Lakes wins with 33 seconds left on the Hail Mary past 19 to 14. But Notre Dame was still awarded the national title the next day. Why? Because the team that finished number two, Iowa Proof Flight, Notre Dame defeated. The team that finished number three, Michigan, Notre Dame defeated. The team that finished number four, Navy, Notre Dame defeated. Plus, oh, the number nine, the number 11, and number 13 teams also that year, Notre Dame defeated. So six teams in the top 13. Only one other team right. ever defeated the number two, number three, and number four teams. That was the 71 Nebraska team, who many consider maybe the greatest in college football history. So that team goes on to win the national championship even though they lost their final game of the year. Kind of a rare occurrence, something I can't really think of in this era, but maybe yeah. back then it was a little more common to, to be able to still get those votes at the end. Oh, and think, by the way, also your quarterback, John Hewitt, uh, or I'm sorry, Angelo Bertelli, the first Heisman winner that uh, year for Notre Dame. He was actually in Pre Island, South Carolina in officer training. He left the team on November 1st. So he can begin the Marine training. I mean, could you imagine the reaction today you'd have on message boards? Well, is there any way they can bring him back for a few games or anything like that? But Johnny Lujak stepped in, and he'd be a future Heisman winner. But he'd be off to World War II soon thereafter. And a great story. Emil Sitko, uh, he always wanted to go to Notre Dame, but he was playing for Great Lakes. And after the game, he met with Coach Leahy uh, of Notre Dame. And he said, Coach, how are you doing? And he said, not so good, Emil. My team lost today. And Sitko's memorable response was, so did mine. So, <laughs> a little you know, different a, a era. Different era right. Definitely a different era. And so when did Bertelli find out up the Heisman? Was he over? Yeah, he got a telegram. Um, he was just coming out of uh, Quonset Hut, he said. And somebody wired him a telegram saying, you just won the Heisman Trophy. And this came, you know, not... You know, I, almost minutes after they lost to Great Lakes. So he said one minute he was just down, and then the next minute it was he perked up. And then it also helped that Notre Dame, you know, won the national title as well. Who were some of those 7, 9, 10, 11 ranked teams or those other big powers that they played then? Well, uh, you had Northwestern finish number ninth, Army, which would go on to win the national title the next two years with the Blanchard and Davis combination, and it was really stockpiling. Uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, will finish 13th uh, that season. Notre Dame defeated them 55-13 and defeated Michigan at Michigan 35-12. So it was like, uh, you know, that Bertelli won the Heisman and Creighton Miller was number four, their halfback, who led the nation in rushing. And then Jim White, a lineman, was number nine for Notre Dame. So they had three in the top nine for the Heisman voting, which I, I don't think you might ever see that again. <laughs> Well, like we said, a busy week this week for uh, Irish history. All two other national championship teams had kind of monumental or happenings this week. There was the 1973 team. Yeah. This is important because uh, November 22nd, they played Air Force on Thanksgiving Day, uh, you know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 40 years ago now. And that was uh, the, the last time the Notre Dame yeah. Stadium wasn't a sellout. I, I was at that game, actually, 11 years old. and. Beautiful day in the six, about 63 degrees, but it was part of a doubleheader on ABC. This was when you could appear only three times over a two-year period on national television. But the first game was 
Nordame versus Air Force, and Nordame already received the invitation to play in the Sugar Bowl. And the next game was Alabama LSU. The winner of that game would play Nordame in the Sugar Bowl. So kind of some things like similar to last year and all. But what was also fortunate was Ohio State was number one, and Michigan was also ahead of Nordame that same weekend. And all you're thinking is, God, those two teams need to tie because that's the only way you'll be able to play for the national title in the Sugar Bowl. And lo and behold, it was a 10-10 tie, no overtime back then. And so that moved Alabama to number one after they beat LSU, and Nordane moved up to number three. So therefore, the national title was going to be between Nordane and Alabama. And then finally, real quickly, we'll touch on this one too because it's hard to leave it out, but the last time number one and number two, Notre Dame and USC, met at the L.A. Coliseum was 25 years yeah. ago in the, the 1988 season. There was obviously some, some big things going on that week as well too. Oh, uh, you wouldn't believe the calls we were fielding. Uh, we were in the office that morning and uh, the word just came out that Lou Holtz sent his leading rusher, Tony Brooks, and his leading receiver, Ricky Waters, home for repeated tardiness. And, there was just, I mean, you thought there was going to be an insurrection among Notre Dame fans. There goes the national title and everything. Biggest game in our lifetime or whatever, and, or in 15 years or 11 years, whatever. It's the Everett Golson suspension in a lot of yep. contexts. Yeah, yep. and uh, Notre Dame proceeded to play an outstanding game, beat USC 27-10. to 10. Lost the statistical battle, actually. USC had, I think, like 21 first downs, and Notre Dame had only eight. But a 65-yard run by Tony uh, Rice at quarterback early, a 64-yard interception return by Stan Spagala right before halftime. Those were two monumental plays, plus uh, plus three in turnovers, four to one. Notre Dame forced four and had only one, and that's usually the bottom line in determining outcomes. Well, that's it for a very memorable week in Notre Dame history. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week as we wrap up the regular season in 2013, and uh, we'll see you then.